Good day, students. Today we'll be taking the 2024 May-June Cambridge GCSE Physics 0625 Paper 2 Brilliant 1. Without delay, let's start working. Question 1. We, in which row are quantities correctly categorized into scalar quantities and vector quantities? A. We have mass and energy. Mass and energy are scalar quantities. Weight and acceleration, those are vector quantities. A is the correct answer to question one. That's good. Question two, which name is given to the quantity of matter in an object? The quantity of matter in an object depicts its mass. B is the correct answer, mass. Question three, a body is moved from place X to place Y, where the gravitational field strength is different. What happens to its mass and to its weight? If gravitational field strength is, is different, then the weight will be different because weight is mass multiplied by gravitational field strength. But the mass does not change because mass represents the amount of matter in an object and the amount of the object does not change. The amount of matter in the object does not change. So mass does not change, but weight changes. That makes B the correct answer to C is the correct answer to question three. We move straight to question four. The mass of an object is 2.5 kg. The volume of the object is 450 cm cube. What is the density of the object? Um, density is defined as mass per unit volume. If mass is 2.5 kg, and taking note of the options in the answer, mass is given in gram per cm cube. So we have to convert mass to grams by multiplying by 1000. That means the mass of the object is 2,500 grams, 2,500 grams, while um, the volume of the object is 480 cm cube. So we calculate the density by dividing the mass, which is 2,500, by the kilo, by the volume, which is 480 cm cube. Um, 2,500 divided by 480, that should give us about 5. Yeah, that should be 5.2 grams per cm cube, grams per centimeter cube. That makes B the correct answer to question number 4. We move to question number 5. Four objects each have two forces acting on them. Which object is in equilibrium? For an object to be in equilibrium, the resultant forces... The resultant forces must be equal to zero. The resultant moment must be equal to zero. So where do we have that here? That is A. The resultant forces is zero. Why? Because the force acting from the left is balanced by the force acting from the right. Okay? B. Resultant force is zero, but resultant moment is not zero because there will be a resultant clockwise moment. So A is the correct answer to question number five. We move to question number six. A ball of mass M falls vertically and hits a hard surface. Its speed on hitting the surface is V, V1. It bounces, it rebounds vertically upwards. Okay, it falls vertically and hits a hard surface with a speed V1. After hitting the surface, it rebounds vertically upwards. Okay, with speed V2. When it rebounds, its speed is given as V2. What is the change in momentum? Don't forget that change in momentum is M open bracket final velocity minus initial velocity. But take note that um, velocity is a vector quantity, hence the direction of the velocity is of critical significant importance. What is the direction of the initial velocity? Downward. What is the direction of vertical velocity? Upward. So they are acting in opposite direction. So if you take one as positive, the other one must be taken as negative. Let's take the direction of the final velocity as positive. So if you take the direction of final velocity as positive, then we are taking the direction of initial velocity as being negative. Hence, we can write the change in momentum as mass, open bracket, final velocity is positive, minus initial velocity is negative, minus V1 minus v1 yeah that's how you deal with this problem minus v1 um it's not clearly written here so i'm going to fix that and make sure everything is written clearly 
So that is what we have. Then um, that simply means the change in momentum equals to m open bracket v2 minus multiplied by minus will give us plus v1. And that's the same thing as m open bracket v1 plus v2. That makes it the correct answer to question six. Question seven. A stone is dropped from a tall tower and falls a distance of 50 meters to the ground. The stone has a mass of 3 kilograms. At which speed does the stone fall to hit the ground? Um, how do you get that? Don't forget that the stone that is falling, the stone that is falling, it falls from a height of 50 meters. And um, that simply means when the stone is about to land, okay, the stone that was falling at that height of 50 meters, it has gravitational potential energy. Okay, it has gravitational potential energy. When it's about to land, all its gravitational potential energy will be converted to kinetic energy. That simply means when it's about to land, all its gravitational potential energy must be equal to the kinetic energy. So all the gravitational potential energy at that height of 50 meters must be equal to the kinetic energy when it's just about to land. Now we're looking for the speed when it's about to land. What formula do you use for that? Since its gravitational potential energy is equal to kinetic energy, the formula for gravitational potential energy, mgh, formula for kinetic energy, half mv squared. So we can say mgh is equal to half mv squared. Mass is present in both sides, so we can cancel out M from both sides. Then we have GH is equal to half V squared. If you make V, this, if you make v the subject of formula, okay, we make V the subject of that expression, that means V will be equal to root 2GH. That's the formula we use to find the velocity just when it's about to land. So if you proceed root 2GH, root 2 times 9.8, times the height is 50, that will give us the square root of 50 times 2 is 100. 100 times 9.8 will give us 980. Square root of 980 will give us 31 meters per second. That makes B the correct answer to question 7. We move to question 8. Question 8. A coal-fired coal fired power station generates electricity. Coal is burned and energy, is, energy released is used to boil water. The steam from the water makes generator move and this produces electricity. Which goal gives the name of the energy store in coal? Energy store in coal is chemical energy. And energy store in the moving generator, moving, motion, that's kinetic energy. So that makes be the correct answer to question number eight. We move to question number nine. A man put some ice into a glass of water on a warm day. After a short time, he notices that the ice disappears and that water droplets appear on the outside of the glass. Which two changes of state are taking place? Condensation and freezing. Um, you know, first of all, the ice will be melting. Then um, water vapor from the air will condense on the glass. So it will be melting and condensation. Condensation and melting, B. That makes B the correct answer to question 9. Question 10. A gas of volume 200 cm cube is trapped inside a container by a piston. The piston is pushed to the right and the volume of the gas decreases to 100 cm cube. The temperature of the gas remains constant. Okay, so um, this will be the concept from Boyle's law, P1V1 equals to P2V2. Let's proceed. Which rule states the effects? that this has on the kinetic energy of the gas particles and the force per unit area exerted by the particles colliding with inside walls of the container. Okay, what you have here, um, since the since volume is halved, since volume is halved, okay, since volume is halved, then what happens to pressure? Then pressure will be double so pressure will be double yeah let's see kinetic energy of the particles uh -huh. now what happens to kinetic energy of the particles you know gas particles are constantly moving and what determines the kinetic energy of the particles 
temperature. Increasing the temperature simply means the average kinetic energy of the particles increase. But you are told that the temperature of the gas remains constant. If temperature is constant, then the average kinetic energy of the gas particle remains constant. The only thing you have done is that you have reduced the confined space. You have reduced the space. Hence, the concentration of gas particles per unit volume will increase. So gas particles are more concentrated. Hence, there will be more frequent pollution, which means there will be higher pressure. But the average kinetic energy of the particles remain constant. Don't forget that average kinetic energy of the particle is also the work done by gas particle, and that is pressure times volume. Good. So having the pressure, doubling the volume, no difference has been made to PV. So kinetic energy remains constant, okay, and pressure will be doubled. That makes C the correct answer to question number 10. Question number 10 is C. Now we move to question number 11. Question number 11. Which graph shows the relationship between the pressure and volume of a fixed mass of gas at constant temperature? You know, according to Boyce's law, temperature is constant, and the relationship is that PV is equal to constant. Okay, that also suggests that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So ideally, you would expect a straight line like this to represent inverse proportionality, but that is not the case because as long as there are gas particles, it is not possible for the volume to zero to be zero. Also, um, yeah, it is also impossible for pressure to be zero. So the line will never strike this axis. As long as there are gas particles, you can never have the volume as being zero. So D is the correct answer. Okay, yeah. So you have the graph being straight this way, indicate the inverse proportionality. But it will never strike um, any of the axes. You would never have intercept on any of the axes because it's not possible for the pressure to be zero as long as there are gas particles. It's also not possible for the volume to be zero as long as you have gas particles. Okay? All right, now we move to question 12. During evaporation of a liquid, the most energetic particles escape. The temperature of the remaining liquid changes. Which row identifies where these changes escape, where these particles escape from, and describe the temperature changes? During evaporation, most energetic particles escape. Since it's evaporation, even if it's boiling, particles escaping, they only escape from the surface. They can't escape throughout. So they can only escape from the surface, okay? Then temperature of the remaining liquid, what happen? Since it's evaporation, evaporation leads to cooling. Okay, yeah. So the temperature of the liquid will be decreasing. Okay, so temperature of the liquid decreases. So where do you have both being correct? That is C. The correct answer to question 12 is C. We move to question 13. Wet clothes are put out on a line to allow the water in the clothes to evaporate. Which type of weather would cause water to evaporate most quickly? What are the factors that um, enhance evaporation? Large surface area, large surface area, low humidity, or you say dry air. Low humidity, or you say dry air. The another one is wind. Good. Another one is wind. Large surface area, low humidity, wind, and what? The last one is increase in temperature, okay? Or you say high temperature. So which option has um, this, um, which of these options has these, um, these conditions satisfied? A, a cold day, no, not a cold day. B, cold day, no. C, a hot day with no wind. D is the correct answer. We have a hot day and we have wind. Now we move to question number 14. There's an issue with question number 14, so we're not going to take question number 14. We move to question number 15. So Cambridge has their own ways of ensuring that even if there's a mistake, the mistake will be rectified at marking and ensure the right thing is done and the right marks are awarded. Okay? All right, let's proceed. Question number 15. Question number 15. 
A solar heater is designed to absorb energy from sunlight. Which surface, texture, and color would be best for solar water heater? If you're absorbing heat from sunlight, that's you're trying to absorb heat by radiation, and the best absorber of heat by radiation is the matte black surface, okay, or a dull black surface. That makes a the correct answer to question number 15. We move to question number 16. Which statement about waves is correct? Waves do not transfer either energy or matter. Waves transfer energy but no matter. Waves transfer both energy and matter. Waves transfer energy without transferring matter. C is the correct answer to question 16. Question 17. The angle of incidence of a ray of light incident on a plane mirror is gradually increased to the nearest degree. What is the maximum possible angle between the incident and the reflected ray? Um, this is the if this is the plane mirror, it is the plane mirror, and we have the normal here. Um, when the angle of incidence is this way, angle of reflection goes the other way, okay? Angle of incidence, angle of reflection. If we increase the angle of incidence to the one I'm doing with color red, the angle of reflection goes, increases as well. Now, the maximum angle of incidence will be these that I'm drawing in color green, okay? An angle of reflection goes, follows the same pattern. What's the angle between them? The maximum angle you can have between them is what you have, is what you have here. Let me see, produce the normal. Maximum angle you can have between them is what we have here, which is 180 degrees. Let me remove the normal so you can see it clearly. So that makes D the correct answer to question number 17. Question 18. Which conditions are necessary for light to be totally internally reflected? Um, incident light, incident light is in less dense medium. No, incident light must be in the denser medium. Then angle of incidence, angle of incidence less than critical angle. No, angle of incidence must be greater than critical angle. So where do you have both conditions satisfied? That's option D. That makes D the correct answer to question number 18. We move to question 19. The diagram shows a ray of light passing from air into transparent substance. What is the refractive index of the transparent um, substance? Refractive index is sine angle of incidence over sine angle of refraction. Angle of incidence is 40 degrees. Angle of refraction is 30 degrees. If we take this ratio sine 40 over sine 30, that would give us um, one point, is 1.29. Use a calculator for this, please. Sine 30, I know sine 30 is 0 0.5. Sine 40 over sine 30, that should give us B. B is the correct answer, 1.29, 1.29. We move to question number 20. The diagram shows a ray of light in an optic fiber. Which statements correctly explain the condition for maximum transmission of light by the optical fiber? Now, you know, then there are rays of light, um, there are rays of light in the optic fiber, okay? Then let me just draw an exaggerated version. So this is the optic fiber, okay? Now let me draw rays of light. There are rays of light in the optic fiber. I'm representing a ray with color red. Let me represent another ray with color blue. So there are rays of light in an optic fiber, and those rays of light travel through the fiber through a multiple reflections, okay? They travel through the optic fiber through multiple reflections till they get to the end of it. Now, which um, statements correctly explain the condition for maximum transmission? For it to have maximum transmission, that means the light ray in color blue must be transmitted successfully, and the one so the one with very large angle of incidence will be transmitted successfully. And the one with less angle of incidence, you know, angle of incidence with the one in color red is less than angle of incidence with the one in color blue. So you want all the rays of light to be transmitted successfully, whether the angle is large in the case of color blue or the angle is less in the case of color red. Let's see. Um, let's see the options we have here. The glass must slow the light as little as possible no we want our refractive index to be large so the glass would slow the light as much as possible as much as possible okay what else 
to make the critical angle for glass as large as possible. When critical angle is large, what does that mean? When critical angle is large, then that simply means the, the, you know, for us to have total internal reflection, the angle of incidence must be greater than critical angle. So when critical angle is large, that simply means only very large angle of incidence would lead to successful transmission. Less smaller angle of incidence, the ray would not be transmitted successfully. Okay, and it will lead to heating of the optic fiber cable, fiber optic cable. So that simply means when angle of incidence, when critical angle is large, that simply means rays that are traveling at very large angle of incidence will be transmitted successfully. Okay, that means a ray like this one in color red with smaller angle of incidence would not be transmitted successfully and will lead to the heating of this cable. So we don't want the, a large critical angle. We want smaller ang critical angle. When critical angle is small, when critical angle is small, then rays that have little angle of incidence, that small angle of incidence alone will still be larger than the critical angle. And a ray like this, one in color red, will be transmitted successfully. So we want to make sure our critical angle is small. Critical angle for the fiber optic cable is as small as possible. That's what we want. We want critical angle to be as small as possible. So it is only option D that correctly satisfies all of these correct conditions. That makes D the correct answer to question number 20. Question 21. Which region of electromagnetic spectrum is used for detecting fake back noise? That is very easy. Ultraviolet rays. Question number 22. A sound, travel, a sound wave travels as 330 meters per second. The distance between the center of the compression and the center of the nearest wave fraction of the wave is 2.5 cm. You know, sound wave travels through multiple, through um, refractions, refractions rather, and um, compressions. So I'm drawing sound wave this way. So this is just an illustration. This region where the lines are close together, representing a compression, and this region where the lines are not far, are not close together, is representing a refraction. We have another compression, we have another refraction, a compression, a refraction, a compression. That's how sound travels. Now, the distance between a compression and a refraction is defined as wave. No, the distance between a compression and the next compression is called wavelength. Or you say distance between a refraction and the next refraction is called wavelength. Now, in this question, you were told that the distance between the compression and the refraction is 2.5 cm. What is wavelength? Wavelength is double of the distance between the compression and the refraction. So everything together now will now be 2.5 plus another 2.5. That will give you the wavelength. So that simply means the wavelength here is five centimeters. Please, if you don't understand this concept, make sure you watch this part of the video again. Five centimeters, convert to meter, you divide by 100. That means wavelength is 0 0.05 meters. Now we have the speed of light already to be 30 meters per second. How do you get the frequency? From the formula, V is equal to F lambda. That simply means F equals to V over lambda. Where V is the speed of light, which is 330 meters per second. And lambda is the wavelength, which is 0 0.05. So 330 divided by 0 0.05, that should give you 6,600 hertz. Yes, 6,600 hertz, that's all you get. That makes, let me check that, please. 330 divided by 0 0.05, that will give me 6,600 hertz, yeah. That makes it the correct answer to question number 22. We move to question number 23. Which waves are used in medical scanning of soft tissue? Uh, when it comes to fetal scan, what do you use? Ultrasound. Very easy. Which road describes suitable material for use in temporary magnets and permanent magnets? Temporary magnets, we use um, soft iron, okay? Permanent magnets, we use steel. Okay, yeah, soft iron for temporary magnet, steel for permanent magnet. That makes 
Um, B, the correct answer to question number 24. Question number 25. The magnetic field is represented in the diagram by magnetic field lines. At which point is magnetic field strongest? That is A. Yes, the distance between the lines tells you um, the strength of the magnetic field. And when the lines are closer together, it simply means magnetic field is strongest. Question number 26. The student determines the resistance of a resistor. She uses a circuit including a voltmeter and an ammeter. Which circuit does she use? Okay. Voltmeter in series, that's wrong. Ammeter in parallel, that's wrong. Ammeter in parallel, that's wrong. Ammeter must be in series, voltmeter must be in parallel. That makes D the correct answer to question 26. 27. A diode and a resistor are connected across a variable DC supply. Variable DC. A variable DC can also be, it can, when you are varying it, then you can make it work as if it's an AC. Terminal X is the initial positive and at a maximum value. So that simply means if terminal X is at a maximum value, that simply means terminal X is positive relative to terminal Y. Okay? The potential difference PD across XY is adjusted so that it changes. Now we start changing the voltage. We start changing the voltage. But in this question, the changing is this way okay normally ac goes this way okay but it's a dc that you are varying so it's going from positive to negative yeah going from positive okay when x y was positive then when x was positive relative to y and then it switches to x being negative relative to y that's what this line here means okay it's going from positive and then it goes to negative so that what they're telling is that initially current wants to flow this way Okay, since X was positive. The coins cannot flow this way because of this diode. Yes, so when this thing was this way, it simply means there will be no current. The output would have a flat initial end because of the diode. When this part was positive, let me zoom out so you can see everything. So when this part was positive, when X was positive relative to Y, coins want to flow this way. But coins cannot flow through because of this diode. So when this one was positive, which is depicted by um, this part of the input, the output will be flat. There will be no output. But when we now switch to the negative part, which is depicted by this part now, okay, that means um, this place has become positive, and Y has become positive relative to X. X will now become negative. And in this case, coins want to flow this way would it work yes because the diode arrow in the diode is pointing this way so coins can flow this way so when you get to this second half okay when this part is positive then coins will flow so you have this okay coins is flowing through the diode so that makes d the only correct option here to question number 27. this is the correct answer to question 27. question 28 when a conductor in a complete circuit cuts across a magnetic field. A current is induced in the conductor. Which statement about the induced current is correct? A, the induced current is in the same direction as the motion, of course not. They are all perpendicular to each other. The induced current is the opposite direction, not the, not opposite, not in the direction. It must be perpendicular. The direction of the induced current is the same as the direction of magnetic field. No, it can't be in the direction of magnetic field. It will be perpendicular. The direction of the induced current opposes the change causing it. Excellent. That's one concept of um, um, electromagnetic. That's one con con concept of electromagnetic induction. And then from the concept of Faraday's law, there's an induced EMF when a conductor comes through a magnetic field. But the induced current, the induced EMF acts in a way that opposes the change causing it. That makes the, the correct answer to question 28. 29. Let me zoom in so you can see everything clearly. The diagram shows a solenoid carrying an electric current. This is a solenoid. Which will compress the strength of magnetic field due to the solenoid at point Y and Z with the strength of the magnetic field at point X? Point Y and Z with point strength of magnetic field at X. Magnetic field at Y equal to X. Magnetic field at Y equal to X. Yes, they are equal because they are both in the middle inside the magnet. That's correct. Magnetic field at Z less than X. 
Magnetic field as Z less than X. That's also correct. That makes A the correct answer to 29. We've got to question number 30. A conducting wire is placed between the poles of a magnet. This is the conducting wire. When an electric current in the wire is a direction shown, the force on the wire acts out of the page. So the force on the wire acts out of the page, like towards us. Three statements of, dif of different conditions and how the wire is affected are given. Let's see. When the current is towards the top of the page, now when we reverse the direction of current, when we reverse the direction of current, what happens to the direction of magnetic field? It will be reversed. When the current is towards the top of the page, the direction of magnetic field is unchanged. The direction of magnetic field is unchanged. When we reverse the current, the direction of force, okay, will be reversed. That's what I meant to say. Or direction of motion will be reversed. So when we reverse the direction of um, current, okay, and the direction of magnetic field is unchanged, magnetic lines of force remains the same direction, not to south. So if you are reversing the direction of current now, then the direction of motion will be reversed. The force produced acts into the page. The force produced in this case will now act into the page in the opposite direction. It will no longer follow this direction, okay, because the direction of current has been reversed. The direction of motion will be reversed. That's correct. One is correct, okay. When you change the direction of current, the direction of motion will be changed. That is correct. Let's go with the second one. When the current is towards the bottom of page, the direction of current remains towards the bottom of page. Don't forget magnetic lines of force from north to south, and the, in, the motion that is produced is out of the page. Let's continue. When current is towards the bottom of page, current is not reversed. Magnetic field is reversed. Now, when you reverse magnetic field, when you reverse magnetic field, what happens? Direction of motion will be reversed. When you reverse magnetic field, I mean, you turn this one to the north pole, turn this one to the south pole, then direction of motion will be reversed. Direction of motion between becomes into the page. That's how it works. Force produced will act into the page. That's correct, too. Let's go to the third one. When the current in the wire is alternating, when the current in the wire alternating, that means it goes downward, uh, positive half cycle, goes upward, negative half cycle, go downward, positive half cycle again, goes upward, negative half cycle. When you have alternating currents, what happens? The wire vibrates into and out of page. Yes, when the direction of current is alternating, the direction of motion will also be alternating. And number three is also correct. Which statements are correct? One, two, three. A is the correct answer to question number 30. We move to question number 31. Which type of electric current are in the primary coil and the secondary coil of a setup of a step up transformer? AC. Transformers only work with AC, they don't work with DC. Yeah, because they need a changing current or a changing EMF to be able to produce a changing magnetic field. Is that changing magnetic field that produces an alternating current at the secondary coil? Number 32, a scientist fires alpha particle at a very thin sheet of gold and detects the particles that pass through. Which statement about the results of the scattering experiment is correct? Hey, alpha particles are attracted to the nucleus of the atom in the metal sheet. Alpha particles are not attracted. They only pass through the, at, the, the um, atom, okay? And some that hit the nucleus bounce back, and some are deflected by the nucleus due to the repulsion between the positively charged nucleus and positively charged alpha particles. B, half the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus. No, most of the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus. About more than 95% of the mass of the, 99% of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. Most of the alpha particles are deflected, showing that the nucleus is very dense. And being deflected simply means the nucleus is positively charged. Okay, it is those that bounce back that shows that the nucleus is very dense. Only a small number of alpha particles are deflected, but some of these are deflected through large angles. That is correct. Very few alpha particles are deflected. If you look at this simulation that depicts the experiment, so when I, when I click on fire this gun, alpha particles moving upward, very few of them are deflected, okay? And some are deflected, 
most of them just pass through this one passing through without being deflected some are deflected and very few of them are deflected by large angles yes yeah, so that is what the simulation tells us about the that's just a visual representation though yes yeah, so that's what we have here that makes d the correct answer to question number 32 we move to question number 33 the notation represents the nucleus of gold atom. The relative charge of a proton is plus one. What's the relative charge of gold nucleus? And the, prot the, protons, the protons are the only possibly charged um, um, sub atomic subparticles, okay? And gold has 79 proton. That simply means the charge of the nucleus of gold will be plus 79, which makes A the correct answer to question 33. Question 34, an isotope of hydrogen an isotope of hydrogen has the nuclide notation H21. How many neutrons are in the nucleus of this isotope? And what is the relative charge of the nucleus? Uh, if um, this represents, this is the number of protons, so it has one proton. And this is number of protons and neutrons. That simply means it has one proton and one neutron. Yeah, that's what makes these two here. So it has one proton and one neutron. That's all. Number of neutrons is one. Relative charge. What is the relative charge on the nucleus? Since it has one proton, it will have a charge of plus one. Relative charge of the nucleus is plus one. Yeah, yeah that's it. That makes um, A the correct answer to question 34. Because it has one neutron and the relative charge of the nucleus is plus one due to one proton in the nucleus. We move to question number 35. A radioactive source is placed near a detector. The radiation arriving at the detector from the source is measured for 10 minutes with different materials placed between the source and the detector. Which type of radiation are emitted by the source? Um, a, we have alpha particles and gamma rays. Let's see, when, we, there's no, when there's no material here, this was the count rate. Now, when we place paper here, this is the count rate. The count rate even increase. And you know, paper stops alpha particles. Paper stops alpha particles. So placing paper and removing paper did not make any difference. That means there were no alpha particles. Now let's see. When we put aluminum, when we put aluminum here, what happened? When we put aluminum here, the um, radiation detected reduced. That simply means there are beta particles. Why? Because beta particles are stored by aluminum. And if placing aluminum there reduce the, the number of um, radiation detected, that simply means there are beta particles. Now, when we remove aluminum and place lead here, what happens? With lead here, the count rates that we got also reduce. That simply means there are gamma Rays. So we have beta particles and gamma rays. That makes option C the correct answer to question number 35. We move straight to question number 36. The reading on a detector placed near a radioactive material is 536 counts per second. Background count rate is 44. This is the reading, and background count rate is 44. The half life of the radioactive material is 34 years. What is the reading on a detector after 68 years? Don't forget that um, the actual actual count rate actual count rate will be what what the machine is counting minus background radiation because background radiation is like noise that would always show even when there is no radioactive source there always be background radiation so let us minus background radiation from what we had initially that will give us 490 Eight. Wait, let me confirm this. 490. Hold on, please. Hold on. 40 minus 36. Sorry, 36. Yes, 498. That's what I have here. Now, what is next? The half-life is 34 years. What is the reading after 68 years? And that means 34 plus 34 gives me 68. Okay, that simply means there are two half life stages. Okay, to undergo two half life stages, right? So 
this um, 498, I will multiply it by half times half. Or see, I will, I will divide it by 4. 498 divided by 4, that will give me 120. Hold on, hold on. Did I make a mistake? Let me just confirm. 536 minus 44. 536 minus 44. That gives me 492. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's 492. I knew there was something wrong. This is this here should be 492. 492. So what I will do is that. 492 times half times half, that will give me 123. Okay, 123 count per second. Now, is this what the machine will, will read? No. This is what the count rate will be due to the radioactive source. But don't forget that there will always, there will always be background radiation. So this actual count rate, I will add background radiation to it because there will always be background radiation acting as noise, okay? Both from the beginning and at the end, there will always be background radiation. So if I add 44 to 1, 2, 3, I will get 1, 6, 7 counts per second. That is what the machine will detect, 167 counts per second. That makes B the correct answer to question number 36. We move to question number 37. I want to be sure my mic is not off. A planet in the solar system is at the point in an orbit, in its orbit, where it is closer to the sun. Which row is correct? And you know the orbit of planets is an, is, a, is elliptic, okay? So if the sun is here, when the planet is close to the sun, it has maximum kinetic energy. It has maximum kinetic energy and less gravitational potential energy. And when the planet is at this point on the right, when it is far from the sun, it has less kinetic energy. That means it moves slowly, okay? And it has maximum gravitational potential energy because of that large distance from the sun. So let's see the orbit at its maximum. Orbital speed is at the maximum. Which one is correct? Is at the point in its orbit where it is closest. So when it is closest to the sun, what do we have? We have maximum kinetic energy, okay? So that simply means the speed is at the maximum. The speed is at the maximum, that's correct. Then energy of gravitational potential store is at the minimum. Is at the minimum. That makes B the correct answer to question number 37. Now we move to question 38. What is the main process that powers the sun? Nuclear fusion okay hydrogen become begins to fuse together to form helium so burning of helium no burning of hydrogen no nuclear fusion of hydrogen to form helium c is the correct answer to question 38 39 a galaxy is 3.0 times 10 to the power 20 kilometer from the earth at which speed is the galaxy moving away the receding speed of a galaxy is distance from the from us multiplied by Hubble's constant. We have the distance as 3.0 times 10 to the power 20 kilometers. Hubble's constant is 2.2 times 10 to the power minus 18 per second. Okay, per second. So if you multiply these two, you get 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power 2, which is 60, 660 kilometers per second. Why? Because the distance is given in kilometers. So 660 kilometers per second. That makes C the correct answer to, let me see. Oh, these meters per second, pardon me. These kilometers per second. Ah, so you must always put SI units into consideration. The SI unit is very important, okay? The SI unit is very important, okay? Since you are given is in kilometer here, then you have to state it in kilometer. Your answer stated in kilometer, and you must pick the one in kilometer. Don't mistakenly pick the one in meters per second. So question number 40, an astronomer observes a distant galaxy. The table shows how the distance and the speed of recession of the galaxy are determined, which is correct. Distance um, is gotten from brightness of a supernova in the galaxy. That's correct. 
then speed of recession change in wavelength of starlight from galaxy that is also correct okay that's that's fine that makes it the correct answer to number 40. yeah change in wavelength and then um, what is that that is the concept of red shifting red shifting okay the essence of red shifting helps us to determine the receding speed of the galaxy from us because um, it is the receding it's because that galaxy is receding from us that's what causes red shifting okay yeah and the brightness of a supernova from us can tell us the distance because all supernovas are considered to have the same brightness that brings us to the end of this um, concept okay if you need detailed explanation kindly reach out to me on physics.4.everybody at gmail.com does everybody at gmail.com you can also reach out to me for personalized physics tutorial classes okay you can reach out for me for personalized physics tutorial classes and i'll be happy and i'll be very very glad to take you through this process and ensure you make excellent grades in your examination thank you for joining us today please subscribe to this youtube channel do have a nice day goodbye